next uh, speaker, I've heard his name pronounced Dash Jr., Dashir, but it's actually Dasher. So please welcome Luke Dasher to the stage to talk about briefly, comma, why block sizes shouldn't be too big. Dasher, and I'm going to briefly go over why block sizes shouldn't be too big. To understand why block sizes shouldn't be too big, you first have to understand how Bitcoin works. Miners collect the transactions into the blocks and users verify the blocks are actually valid. This is important for making sure that the miner doesn't put a transaction in that spends coins that don't exist, creates inflation out of nowhere, steals someone else's Bitcoins. If the users don't verify this, then miners can do basically anything. Because the users do this, 51% attacks are limited in what they're able to do. They can only do a reorg, which is undoing transactions that the miner themselves sent. Any other transactions can be reconfirmed as long as the sender isn't malicious as well. So um, if there's no users actually verifying this, not only can the miners do this, but it's also essentially is incentivizing them to do it because why not? If, if we wanted to trust someone, the centralized issuer, we could just be using a fiat currency. We don't need proof of work or miners or any of this. So now the question is how many full nodes are actually needed? Obviously miners could be running the full nodes, but that doesn't really protect the network at all. They can just modify the protocol rules on their full node to do whatever they feel like mining. If you alone don't run a full node, that puts you at risk. The, the miners were to do something, then you might exceed their invalid block causing inflation as valid, and you might accept their transaction with inflation. But it really wouldn't hurt anyone but yourself. Um, it would hurt you because then all of a sudden you're using a currency that nobody else is and nobody's going to take your payment. But what if most people don't run a full node? Then at that point there's economic pressure for the invalid chain in this event. If the minority are running a full node, their coins aren't going to be accepted by the majority who are not. And at that point we have a currency that the miners control essentially replacing Bitcoin. So we need at least a majority that are, in fact, using their own full node to ensure that the miners cannot create inflation or do it, break any of these other rules that we just assume are Bitcoin's rules. And wh what happens if all of the, uh, it, we have a majority of full nodes, but they're all in the US, and then the US goes to sleep in the middle of the night, the rest of the world is going to continue doing commerce during the day. That gives time for the miners to potentially cause inflation overnight, and then the U.S. wakes up and can't interact with the rest of the world. So for that reason, we need not just a majority, not just a simple supermajority either. We need to have a sufficient majority such that the whole world is covered. There's a, there's a majority all the time, not just you know one part of the day or another part of the day. And so for that reason, I usually estimate this to be around 85% of people using Bitcoin. The, not necessarily the people, but the economic activity. People buying and selling, how much are they buying and selling during the day. So then the, another question involved in this is how difficult is it to run a full node? Um, a straw man involved with the uh, block size stuff is that everyone can download two megabytes in 10 minutes. Sure. But that's not the issue. Um, another argument is that we have multi-terabyte hard drives and that therefore be can store the entire history. But that's never been the issue either. We have pruning that can take the full node down to five gigabytes or less. The main problem really is the initial blockchain download or the synchronization. When you first install a full node, it takes time to go catch up from when Bitcoin started in 2009 to the present. And the block size is the rate of change of all that data that it has to process initially. 
And there's, it, right now it's manageable. Most people can do it. It takes, in the worst case, a few weeks. But the question really isn't, can they do it? Can people do this initial sync? Is, will they do the initial sync, or will they just switch to a light wallet and forget about the initial sync, forget about running a full node because it takes too long or makes their computer too busy too much of the time or uses all their bandwidth? So just being able to do it isn't really enough. People need to actually be choosing to actually run the full nodes on their own. And if it's too hard, people will just choose not to do it, even if they're capable. For the last decade or two, technology has improved about 18% a year. The current two megabyte blocks are about 52 gigabytes a year. I think that might actually be with one, gigab with one megabyte blocks, but either way, the, it's much higher than 18% a year. Um, so the rate that the technology is improving is slower than the rate that the blockchain is growing because of the block size. So things are actually, even though technology continues to improve, computers get faster, software gets optimized more, it's improving slower than the blockchain is growing, and the net effect is that it continues to get harder and harder and harder to sync. Uh, some, some years ago, I was able to run a full node on my phone, no big deal, even though the phones were less capable. It was possible it didn't use too much data. Now it's kind of borderline. People are still doing it, but not very many people. And it's like everything else, it's getting harder. And yet at the same time, society is moving such that people don't want home computers anymore. They want to just use a phone. And that's something Bitcoin may have to adapt to if, if we want people to adopt Bitcoin. And on top of all of this, that 18% a year is just the last decade or two of improvements. It's very possible that someday we may find that we can't continue to maintain that 18%. And if we're still you know, getting harder and harder, it's just going to get a lot worse at that point. If we uh, run some simulations over the different, some various block size possibilities, we can see when the technology will eventually catch up and be start to outpace because the, uh, that 52 gigabytes a year versus 200 gigabytes, that's a significant percentage. But as the blockchain grows, it's going to become a smaller percentage over time. So we can see that it's going, the technology will eventually catch up and start to outpace the block size growth. So for the current two megabyte blocks, the worst case scenario if things continue to improve, is about 1.65 times what it, the current sync time is. And that doesn't sound like much, but with the situation being as bad as it is today, it's a little scary. Um, I also compared it to 2013, which is probably about when we last had the, a really good amount of full nodes used, and that's nine times that. Um, the peak will probably occur around year 2024, We'll get back to the current sync time, not until 2033, and that's quite a ways away. And back to 2013 sync time, not until 2048. That's like a whole generation, pretty much. If we had kept the one megabyte limit, which is history at this point, the peak would be maybe 11% higher from where it is now. And then we'd start to improve. We'd get back to where we are now by 2025, back to 2013 by 2043. It's a little better, but not very good still. If we had 300K blocks, um, obviously, we wouldn't. if we did that now, we wouldn't continue to grow. So we would be at the peak, um, which is currently six times what it was in 2013. We'd get back to the 2013 level by 2035. It's a long time, but it's a lot more manageable than what we have today. There's other issues that concern people with regard to block size. There's the argument that we need a fee market. Um, some people want to run the blockchain over satellite, which is workable right now, but it would work better with smaller blocks. 
and definitely could become an issue with larger ones, even larger. M right now, miners actually use a centralized backbone to relay blocks to each other, and that essentially means miners can't be anonymous. If someone were to try to shut down Bitcoin by confiscating miners, the miners really have no way to hide. And it, part of the way that Bitcoin is censorship resistant is because anyone can mine theoretically, and nobody would be able to stop them from mining a block with those transactions. But that's no longer really the case with if anyone knows who the miners are and can pressure them. Um, a lot of users have bandwidth quotas on their data, cell phones, even the, most, the highest level in the US that I'm aware of is like 50 gigabytes right now per month. Um, but a lot of people are stuck with five gigabytes a month because the, while the backbones can handle the ongoing traffic, it's all shared. So if people are sharing the traffic, it's not the same thing as if people are constantly maxing it out all the time. And that's not even considering that, you know, a lot of people want to watch movies on real time. And if the Bitcoin is taking up all their bandwidth, they can't do that. And that's another case where they could run a full node, but they probably won't. Uh, these are a few reasons. There's obviously others. I'm not going to go into them too much as I have limited time here, but the main issue is the initial sync. Um, a couple of objections. Some people are concerned that smaller blocks will result in higher fees than if we had bigger blocks. And so the argument is often made, we should increase the block size to reduce the fees. Uh, it's not really quite true that the fees are going to be higher with smaller blocks than with bigger blocks. No matter what the block size is, there's always people that want to put their backups on the blockchain, um, do random, store random garbage, just because they can. <laughs> and whatever fee they're willing to pay is always going to set a minimum fee, no matter what the block size is. Um, if the fees rise, then unimportant transactions, like if the fees get to be a dollar or whatever, then people aren't going to be paying the dollar fee just to send a dollar of transaction. They're going to either stop doing that transaction, do it on some layer two, which obviously for a dollar, you don't really need the whole security of making sure that someone can't reverse the transaction on you. So it's okay to move some of that stuff to a layer two, and that will make room for the more important transactions that actually need Bitcoin security and the features that Bitcoin has to offer. We don't actually, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, $50 fees, that's too much. But we don't know what the actual cost of this technology is yet. Um, if, it, if actually maintaining a secure network costs $50 a transaction, we may have to live with that. You can't subsidize everything. It may very well break the system. Um, Another concern with regard to fees is that the fees probably should be higher than the node cost. If we have people, if the fees are, if the node costs more to run than the fees, then people are going to be doing transactions without running a full node. And that's, for all the reasons I mentioned, not very desirable. But if the node is cheaper to run than the transaction fee, it's less likely that people will be transacting unless they're also running a full node already. Another objection is that eventually we will need a block size increase, and that's probably true. Um, it's not a certain truth because we don't know what technology may improve. There may be better scaling technologies that we discover in the future. But it's more important that the network remains secure, decentralized, and can provide the features to get to the point where people actually want to use it. Um, if we lose those features, if we become just another you know, fiat currency, just another PayPal or whatever, people aren't going to care to use Bitcoin, and we won't need a block size increase. <laughs> we should focus on the problems today first before worrying about problems that we're going to have down the road. And as mentioned, eventually the technology will catch up if we can delay increasing the block size until that point by reducing it in the short term, we can get be in a much better place to do the increase then. And we'll be in, that, we'll be in a better place sooner if the smaller the, we keep the blocks in the short term. So this, this, if we keep them smaller in the short term, we can increase the size sooner because we'll be at a point where we've caught up at least.
sometimes people suggest that some of these uh, hardware ready-to-go nodes, they come with the blockchain synced already, and you, know, you just run them, and they're already synced. You can just start using them immediately. Sometimes people suggest that we should have it so that we can sync a snapshot from other nodes on the network. And it's better than a light wallet, but it's still a change in the security model. We're trusting whoever issues those snapshots. Um, and really, the only way to verify that that snapshot's actually legit is to, again, go back to doing the IVD, which needs to be still the, uh, it needs to be something that's the norm. Otherwise, people will be just trusting whoever claims to verify it or produce these snapshots. One of the uh, harder objections to argue with is that it may be already too late. Um, we really should have reduced the block size years ago. We can avoid making the problem worse by not increasing it further, maybe even reducing it now. Um, technology can catch up faster if we avoid making the problem worse. And like I mentioned, we can get to the future of block size increases. We can make that safer sooner. So there's some um, various possible solutions. We can't always just ignore the problem and give up on mobile nodes and just try to deal with it as best we can. Um, miners can always choose to make small blocks. They don't have to fill the block every time. It's, there's a configuration option for Bitcoin D that allows the miner to very easily make smaller blocks if they choose to. What users can do is um, there's a way to add artificial transaction weight. It's not currently implemented in the full node software, but we could make it so that users can choose to pay a slightly higher fee to make their transaction use more of the block's weight without making the block actually bigger and without making it more complicated for the verification. And that doesn't require any protocol change at all to the consensus protocol. It just requires a peer-to-peer -peer layer change. So that's something that you know any one or two users could do between them if they wanted to. When you get into soft forks, there's two different kinds. There's a temporary or a permanent soft fork. A permanent one is probably a bad idea because we do eventually probably want to increase the block size. But it would be very easy to make a soft fork that self-expires automatically, you know, a few years or even months down the road if we, months if we wanted to do a trial run. And just say, at this height, the soft fork is no longer effective. It automatically goes back to what it is now. But any soft fork would need community support and that really needs a uh, user-led action because miners obviously are not choosing to make small blocks. They're not going to spearhead a soft fork. Um, besides the obvious fact that users really need to be behind any soft fork anyway. Right now, I don't believe we have user support for that, but that could change with more education. And that's all I have for today. Thank you.